All right, my friends. How's it going? I'm Scott Hanselman, and I'm very happy to be here today. This is going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully, we'll all learn together, and we'll stay in touch as well on social media afterwards. Let's go ahead and bring up my amazing epic slides first here and take a look. So first off, I was told that Comic Sans was an unprofessional font, so I've already failed at this presentation, and we've only just begun. Uh, what we're going to do right off the bat is switch that font out because that's obviously unacceptable and unprofessional. So we'll switch that into something a little bit more cool. We'll add a little bit of a shadow there, which is nice. And um, now, you know, it's a, it's a white background and I don't really like that. So let's go ahead and put in a nice uh, bit of evocative stock photography because that's the, uh, that's the illusion, right? Isn't that what our desks are supposed to look like if we're software engineers and programmers? They're supposed to have a a nice uh, sunshine streaming into the window there. We've got all the fanciest, latest uh, hardware. That's probably not what your uh, office is going to end up looking like. Your office is probably going to end up looking like this at some point. So right off the bat, I want to take a moment and just break down the illusions about what things are going to look like. Uh, your office will look something between this and this, or my office behind me right here. Although this could be a background. We don't know. But... Above all, we want you to feel welcome. We want you to feel welcome, not just at the Imagine Cup, but we want you to feel welcome in tech, whether it be uh, your first project, whether you're heading into school or you're heading out to school into your first job. Um, we want you to feel welcome and we want you to feel welcome on these teams, right? So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna talk about attitude and style. And then we're gonna start thinking about that within the context of what's called systems thinking and then team dynamics. And then hopefully we'll tell a couple of stories about problem solving, because what you're going to be doing is solving problems. And you're going to be solving problems your entire life, uh, whether they be personal problems or professional problems. And thinking about how you exist within a team and how you exist within a system is the way that you get, as Donna Sarkar says, actionable ideation. And then you're going to think about who your customer is, because sometimes your customer is you. And sometimes it's going to be someone you've never met before. So Travis is going to help us understand that. And then I'm a big fan of failing, but you need a safe place to fail. So we're going to hear about that from Amanda Silver about what a growth mindset is and how important it is to be able to fail safely. And then Seth, one of my favorite storytellers, will probably talk about my stories and say how they're not as good and then tell stories of his own, which is going to be fun. And then we'll send you off into the world to talk about your own stories. So first, let's talk about attitude and style. In the old days, in the old days, uh, you know, tech was a little bit different. And we talk about inclusion right now, but it's interesting to look at this magazine from March of 1984, where we have a young lady here with her bubble gum and her glasses. And uh, she is coding on her TI-89. or TI So she's coding right now. And wouldn't that be wonderful to just go into a uh, grocery store and grab a computer magazine off of the shelf with a young lady on the front looks just like you who is going and in, in coding and having a great time. Um, we've gone away from that a little bit in the 90s and the early 2000s, but I think we're getting back to the realization that coding is for everyone. Tech is for everyone. And that's one of the reasons that we do things here at the um, Imagine Cup and at Microsoft is to make sure that everybody feels included. Now, there's this quote that gets used a lot. And I thought it was a really good quote. I thought it was one of my favorite quotes, but then I realized it's not actually that good. The, the quote is, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. But I found this better alternative that I really like, and it's worth thinking about for a second. Diversity is going to a party, but inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee. Isn't that a great freaking deep quote right there. Inclusion is being a member of the party planning committee. We always talk about making room at the table, but we never talk about who made the table. And that's one of the things that's so powerful about being in software and being in hardware and being in tech. I want you to think really hard about this. There are 8 billion people on the planet and virtually all of them are touched in some way by software. But how many software developers are there? 60 million? 100 million, 10th of a billion, 60 million people are affecting the lives of 8 billion. The power that one has as a software engineer is extraordinary. So whether you are uh, one year into your career 
or whether you're 30 years into your career, the power that you that you have is already incredibly great. And that power should be used to improve the lives of the people around you. And that's really, really uh, powerful stuff. And hopefully you'll build us a new table, which is going to be great. Now, in, I want to say not the 70s, but I was thinking more like the 1500s or even earlier, maybe even the 1200s, early, uh, early days before people could read, before the average Joe or Jane could read, the priests had all the knowledge. They were the ones who knew how to read. They had the books and they would say, look, look at this book that we've brought to you. Da, 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 don't, don't touch it. Just, just look, look at the book. Oh, you can't read. I will read that book to you. And they had power. The reading and the ability that they had to share knowledge was their power. And they kept the power away from the people because the people couldn't read. Okay. When people have power, it tends to be hoarded. It tends to be kept to themselves. This is a great quote from Ted Nelson from 1974. This quote looks like it could have been written in a blog in 2021, but this was actually written many, many years ago. Knowledge is power and tends to be hoarded. So experts rarely want people to understand what they do, and they generally enjoy putting people down. Now, this is a, a, gen, a general quote. It doesn't mean everybody likes to put people down, but it does make you think about when you have knowledge and when you have power, will you help people understand? Will you share that knowledge freely? Will you give that information away? Or will you keep it to yourself and enjoy putting people down? That's an interesting quote, isn't it? All right. So we don't want to develop this technology priesthood, this exclusion, this exclusive club. This is not a club. We want you all to share your knowledge freely so that we can make things better for everyone. This needs to be the case as the uh, as a community, but it also needs to be the case in your small team. So whether it be a team of four, a team of 40, or the entire community that you're a member of, you want to make sure that you are, um, uh, you are conscious. All right, cool. Let's move to the next slide here. All right. Now there's this word that gets used that's called gatekeepers. Now gatekeeping and gatekeepers are at a high level. They're the people that control information flow. But gatekeeping in the, within the uh, context of tech are usually people that are keeping you from your goal by putting up an arbitrary gate, an arbitrary door. They're the people who kind of check your ID as you try to get into the club. They are data decision makers. They're the people who say, you know, I think you need a degree or you don't have enough experience, but in order to get a job, you need experience, but I can't give you an experience without a job. So you're in trouble. And uh, how information flows, whether it be communication or whether it be people uh, who have information, uh, is usually affected by biases like personal preference and social influences, all the different things. So people tend to hire people that from their town, from their school, their alumni. People tend to hire people who look like them. They also tend to hire people who think like them, which is something that we want to watch out for as well. We want to make sure that we're building teams that look like them all, that have all different perspectives and are not just uh, the same people who grew up in the same neighborhood that I grew up in, which is really important. Now, I have been on the internet for a very, very long time. I'm actually going to bring my screen over here and just give you a sense of what a really long time looks like. Here is my blog. I've been blogging now since 2002. And if I go up here and let's just scroll down a little bit, here's 2020, which was not a good year for everybody. I think we all felt that 2020 could have been better. But I was able to eke out a blog post Tuesday and Thursday, basically every single uh, month, every single week, rather. And you'll notice that it's not five days a week. It's once or twice a week, maybe a couple more. Because I'm trying to share my energy. I'm trying to share my energy. I'm trying to use that as an outlet. I'm going to talk more about that. But as you join these teams, you're going to want to think about all the great stuff that you're working on and how you can share that work with others. Because you're going to go and put out some great work on the Imagine Cup. You don't want to waste your keystrokes. You want to share your experiences. You might think to yourself, well, I don't really have anything to talk about. Um, you know, I'm not an expert at anything. What would I even say? 
if you share your energy about the things that you're working on and you think about where you're going to put your keystrokes, I'm going to talk about that in a second, and you're kind, that energy will come back to you. Sometimes it will be lonely. Sometimes I blog and I think no one's listening. But uh, most of the time, that energy comes right back to me. So what do I mean by conserving your keystrokes? Well, this is a little bit of a morbid thing. Some people think that the, this is a bad idea. But I've actually made a website. And the website is called keysleft.com. And this website tells you how many keystrokes are in your hands. What do I mean by that? Well, when I say conserve your keystrokes, this is based on a theory that you're only going to be around for so long, maybe 100 years. So you have a finite number of keystrokes left in your hands before you die. Wow, Scott, that's a downer. Thanks for taking it there. Well, what I'm talking about is you're excited about the Imagine Cup. You're 21 and you type 80 words a minute. You have 317 million keystrokes left in your hands before you die. And they're, they're going down right now as we sit here. So where are you going to choose to spend your time? Where are you going to choose to spend your time? Are you going to write emails? Are you going to write computer programs? Are you going to uh, write novels? Are you going to write tweets. Where are you going to give people the gift of your keystrokes? Why is this important? Well, let's say that you're working in a team. Are you going to send that team emails or chats or slacks? Or are you going to make documents? Are you going to express your thoughts in maybe a, a, a white paper or a one pager and express to people that you have an opinion and have those keystrokes work for you when you are asleep. This is hugely important. Let's say that after this, this wonderful event here, that someone decides to send me a question, or they send Amanda a question, or they say, hey, Donna, this is great. I'm uh, loving what you're talking about. And then we think to ourselves, well, I mean, that's a great question, but I don't know you. I don't want to give you the gift of 2,000 of my keystrokes, you know? But it was a great question. So how do I balance the idea that I can't answer everyone's question? I'm working on a project. I'm doing something in the, in the form of a team. But these are great questions. And this information needs to be shared. How do I deal with the fact that I only have eight hours of work every day? But, you know, there's 24 hours in a day. Maybe I need to work harder. What I do is I go and I will send you an email that is a link to a blog post that I wrote. And the blog post is where I put my keystrokes or a OneNote or a Word document or literally anywhere in the world but email. Could be a Google Doc, could be a SharePoint, it doesn't matter. Somewhere with a URL. So if you're working in a team, rather than sending emails with lots of information, rather than sending a wall of text in a team, consider writing things down in a document, sharing that document on a link to it in an email and then having people chat about it. It really changes things and it makes your keystrokes work for you while you're asleep. So that means I'm going to go to bed and people are going to talk about that document. But if I put it in email, they're not going to be able to find it. They're going to be like, I think we talked about this last week. This can all be really, really confusing. So what you want to do is make a blog, make a medium, put them on you know, Twitter if you have to, anywhere at all that has a URL. Now, when we're doing this, sometimes people will create documents that are going to make you feel um, a little stressed out because it's like, wow, that was an amazing technical document, but I'm, I'm not that good. I'm not a professional. I've been doing this for 30 plus years, and I am still an amateur. I consider myself an amateur because everything that I learned in college, every piece of tech that I learned in college is gone. But I learned how to learn. So when you're working in a team, you're going to be collecting technical knowledge. You're going to be collecting APIs and functions and methods. But what you really want to collect is the knowledge about how to interact with other people. All right. You want to think about personal dynamics because we're all amateurs. Really, there are no true professionals in the software engineering industry. Sometimes someone will say, well, I've got you know, five years experience and you have, I don't know, one. So they have five times more experience. But then we have to ask ourselves, is this a person with 20 years experience or do they just have the same year over and over 20 times? 
this is a really tough thing, I think, for early in career people to think about. But at some point, you're going to have five years experience and then 10 and then 20 and then 30. And you're going to look back on it. And then maybe you'll use that information like those technology priests and you'll use that to exclude people. Or you'll think about how many years you've had the fresh experience, a new experience, a thoughtful experience. I really had to think about uh, what that meant to me because I am now later in my career and uh, I've got a lot of experience in the space, but there were some years there where I was asleep. I let that year go by, okay? That might have meant that uh, a year was wasted and that can be difficult. We need to forgive ourselves when those things happen. For example, you might feel like uh, you're seeing everyone else being more productive. You're on Instagram, you're on Twitter, and everyone is so productive, and they're so much more productive than you are. And you have to forgive yourself because you weren't productive that day. You don't want to get caught up in that hustle culture. And uh, when we think about years of experience, there may be years where you don't do anything interesting, where you don't learn. And what you need to do is catch yourself and try to be intentional and say, I'm going to pause for a second and think about like, Wow, I don't really think I learned anything. I don't. I didn't learn anything at that time. And in not learning something that time, I use that as an opportunity. I use that as a moment to go and reset. You understand? So I reset how I'm thinking about things and I wake up. And then you'll fall asleep again and you'll wake up again. But you'll lose time. And over your career, you're going to want to wake up. Of my 30 years experience in software, I'm going to say probably seven. I didn't learn anything. And sometimes that was a bad boss or it was an uncomfortable company or it was a bad team. But for the most part, it was just me kind of sleepwalking through that. So when you're on your team and you're working on your projects, try to be as in the moment and as present as possible, to be as modest as possible and kind of reset yourself. Because every day is a new day for you to go and wake up with a fresh perspective and try again. You don't have to look back on the past and beat yourself up. Now, there's a great question here from the audience about if we aren't experts, what's the best way to become one? You know, that's a tough one. There are expert surgeons and there are really good software engineers. So when I say there are no experts, I'm saying that technology is moving so fast that the thing that you're an expert in today may not exist tomorrow. Here's a great example. Here's Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee is the inventor of the World Wide Web. OK, so, you know, we all walk around with our experiences and our uh, our knowledge and we know what we did. Imagine walking around and knowing that you're the person that invented the Internet, uh, you know, the World Wide Web as we know it. And I think it's kind of cool that Tim Berners-Lee says that he's a web developer. He could have said the web developer. Everyone's so excited to become a senior engineer to become a senior web developer. And here's Tim Berners-Lee saying, I'm just web developer, not the web developer. That would be a pretty sweet flex about a business card. What do you do? I'm the web developer. Yeah, all of it made that, that was me. Put that on your LinkedIn, kids. So Tim Berners-Lee is an example of being modest and being humble. He's probably an expert, but at the same time, does he know all the CSS and React and Angular? He made the thing but he probably doesn't know the latest frameworks and all of that kind of stuff. So what's the best way to become an expert? So this is what I like to say here. This is my Ted Lasso shirt here. Be curious, not judgmental. Tim Berners-Lee is a great example of that. So what you can do is be curious, be thoughtful, ask questions, but acknowledge that you're never gonna know it all, even if you did invent the web itself. As such, it's a good idea for all of us to find mentors. Find mentors in our lives, collect those mentors. And even if you're me or you're Tim Berners-Lee, you're never too old to get good advice. So a lot of times when we're in tech, we think that mentorship should be an age thing. If you're not careful, you'll end up with your mentorship relationship being a weekly lecture from an old person. And we don't want that. You don't want your relationships to be like this. You want them to be more equal like this. So you should not only find a mentor, you should consider being a mentor. Because I know that our friends 
uh, who are watching today are not too young to share their own experiences. Find someone who's just a year behind and mentor them, help them out. And uh, you'll notice when you're on a, uh, on a team and building up your teams, there's going to be different relationships within that team. You can use those moments to say, you know, hey, I'd love to, to work with you. And maybe you could share some of your knowledge about that. Those are opportunities to find and collect mentors. I like to collect mentors like Pokemon and share them with my friends. And I would encourage you to do the same as well. Now, there's this term mentorship that gets thrown around a lot, but there's also a great word called sponsorship. So as you get later in your career, be thinking about um, be thinking about that word sponsorship. What's the difference? Okay. So mentors are people that you can bounce ideas off of. They help you define your dream. They think about your strengths. You might have a project mentor that can help you with the project, look at the team, think about the team's strengths, advise the team and guide them. But sponsors are more like spotlight. Sponsors create luck for the team by bringing new opportunities and lifting people up into new spaces, giving them uh, a audience that they would not necessarily have, okay? So mentorship and sponsorship are different things, and we wanna think about that. There's actually a spectrum of sponsorship because some people are strategizers and some people are connectors and like to introduce people to each other. Uh, some people just give opportunities. They're just like, oh, I, I have a thing. Maybe you should go talk to this person. They've got a great opportunity and they give you opportunities. They bring you into rooms with them. Uh, some sponsors will advocate for you and uh, talk about you in the best way behind your back. So that is a, a spectrum. Imagine a, a slider bar of, of volume. What kind of a sponsor do you want? Do you want them to lecture you once a week and give their advice? Do you want them to tell stories? Or do you want them to go and actively advocate for you? That's a, a spectrum. A lot of people just thought that a mentor is someone that you talk to every once in a while who's old. That is not the way to do it, okay? And then you may not feel that you have anything to offer. I see questions here in the chat about maybe that I don't have anything to offer. I think that you do. Everybody has a thing. Everyone's um, journey is unique. And I think a lot of us need to give ourselves credit for having an interesting journey. You have interests outside of tech. You have uh, how you grew up. You have your people and your culture and your family, and they're different than mine. And that in itself is an interesting story that you can tell. And you've probably worked on projects or had, uh, had interesting projects at class. Those are all stories that you can tell. So people have uh, more than they, uh, they realize when they can offer. The other thing about mentorship that's important to remember is that uh, it's not forever. It's, uh, it's not something that you get married and you have to stay together forever. It happens in phases. So maybe you have a mentor for a project, or maybe you have a mentor for your degree, or for a problem that you're trying to, um, to work past. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so let's talk about storytelling a little bit because I love telling tech stories. So I'll tell you a few tech stories and maybe if we have enough time, we'll, uh, we'll chat with, uh, with Seth and Morgan, but we'll see. So first story is um, I keep this knife on my, uh, this little Swiss army knife on my desk here because uh, my dad told me once that it's okay to be a funny little knife that isn't amazing at everything. This knife right here is uh, the Swiss army knife and it's not really a good pair of scissors and it's kind of a mediocre saw. There's so much about this knife that makes it kind of ridiculous, but it's, you know, it's a pretty good knife. Uh, and then the other tools are all the other things that it can do like a magnifying glass and a corkscrew and a tiny little pair of sun, uh, these are uh, screwdrivers for your glasses. A lot of people think that they should specialize in tech. You should do one thing and one thing really well. But if you do that, you'll find often that that thing will not be needed anymore. Um, this is a ruler here, but I don't know what this part does, this little bendy part. So that might be a piece of tech that has gone away. So what you want to focus on is being a good knife. You don't want to skimp on the basics. You want to think about the fundamentals of software. Remember, remember before when I said that most of the stuff that I use in my degree is gone. The fundamentals aren't. Learning how to learn. Computers have CPUs. They have memory. They have storage. There's a network. The network adds latency, meaning things slow down when you put stuff on the internet. Those are fundamental things. Whether you have an iPhone or a Windows device or an IoT device, 
the idea that there's a computer in there with a CPU and memory and storage and all those things are the basics. So the fundamentals of problem solving, how systems are built and layered, how you compose things from pieces and the patterns that you're going to see on this project and in your career, they are all fundamental. So it's okay to be a funny little knife. It's okay to be interested in AR and VR and be interested in web development and be interested in game development. Or it's, it's, it's okay to just be focused on, you know, one thing that you care about, the one thing you're super geeked about. But don't skimp on the basics. Build those stories. Listen to the stories about the basics from your, uh, your friends, your mentors, and your sponsors. So here's a couple of silly stories, okay? All right, first, problem solving. Problem solving. You know how you have a person in your school or in your work who is like able to solve problems so quickly and you think to yourself, wow, I don't know how they're able to solve these problems. How, how did you know the answer so quickly? All right. You know, you call a non-technical parent and you help them reboot the router and they're like, how did you know which button to push? You, you didn't know. You don't know. You're just asking yes, no questions at scale. The thing that you're good at is Googling for stuff and going, is that the thing? No, yes, no, yes, no. Breaking problems down at scale. The only difference between me with 30 years experience and you with 30 days or 30 months experience is that I've seen a lot of stuff and I can eliminate things quickly. So let's do a quick brain teaser here. My toaster is broken, people. I need toast. And you might say to yourself, this is not a coding problem, Mr. Hanselman, why are you wasting my time at the Imagine Cup talking about your toaster? Well, in fact, this is a systems thinking problem. We have an issue. We have no toast. This is a huge problem. We need to fix it. So what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to do what? We're going to be simple thinking people and we're just going to buy a new toaster, right? That will solve the problem. Maybe that will solve the problem, but that is simple thinking. We're not thinking about the system within which the toaster exists. This is not a toaster that is floating in white space like this. But notice that this toaster doesn't appear to have an electrical cord, which is concerning. I'm not sure how this toast appeared here. This toaster exists within a system. Your software, your solution, the things that you make exist within a system. So system stick. <clears throat> excuse me, systems thinking for toast. Is the power on? Is the power on? Oh my goodness. Okay. That's great. That's a nice binary yes or no. That's going to answer a lot because if the power is on, then we're going to go off and have a whole other conversation. But if the power is off, well, let's plug something else in. Think about that for a second. I want toast. The toaster is broken. We're focused on the toaster. And the first thing I'm going to do is unplug it and plug something else in scandalous. No, it's systems thinking because it exists within this system that includes power. Well, maybe I blew a fuse. Maybe I'll go out in the garage or the back room and find the fuse box and reset that fuse. Is the power on at all? One time I was uh, uh, giving a presentation at Black Girls Code and the little 14 year old girls, I was teaching them that code and they were like, why are we talking about toast? And uh, we were going through this exercise about the toaster. And uh, I, I was like, these are very clever, clever kids. And then one of them yells out, do the neighbors have power? That was amazing. Think about that for a second. Just like drink this in. I said, I want toast. And now we're looking out the window and asking the question, do the neighbors have power? That is a programmer. That is systems thinking. We're thinking about how I'm going to get this toast, but if the city doesn't have any power, then how am I getting toast today? Turns out that the issue was not at all the toaster. In fact, the young ladies uh, concluded that there was some kind of an electromagnetic pulse and aliens had taken over the world and they'd blown the power out in the entire city. And that was why I did not have toast. So that's how, that's how I learned that I wasn't getting toast that day. Yes. Uh, someone in the chat says, was it DNS? Yeah, it was probably DNS. Uh, it's always DNS. We'll talk about that in a second, actually. Hang on. That's a, and we'll talk about what is DNS and why that matters in a moment. Good, good, fun question there from our friends in the chat. The only difference between early in career and later in career people is that early in career people Google with Bing a lot and later in career people like myself can ask a question, one question, 
and they can eliminate an entire class of problem. They can take the problem space and they can what's, do, what's called bisect it. They can bisect the problem and they can cut it in half. And now a whole chunk of problems fall away. And now I have another one. And I ask a question, I ask a question, I ask a question, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now that joke a moment ago where someone says, it's always DNS, a very famous joke from our American president, Abraham Lincoln. I know that Abraham Lincoln said that because I read it on the internet and everything on the internet is true. Um, this is a list of stuff that came directly out of my brain. I did not go and search the web for any of this. Someone asked me why their website wasn't working and I wrote this list. Now I could probably write 30 pages of stuff like this on the left here. Just little stuff. Is the file locked? Uh, you know, is there a good connection string? Is it DNS? All those questions. The difference between early in career and late in career is that I've collected these, collected past tense, and you are collecting them now. Isn't that interesting? So then how are you gonna get a list like this where you can put this list into your brain? That's where you need the, the comfort, the privilege, and the, uh, the, the allowance to fail fast. You need to be able to fail. Failing can be good. Amanda's going to talk about that uh, in a couple of hours, about an hour and uh, 15 minutes, about how failing can be good. A growth mindset is a person who can collect these, but a good team needs the ability to fail without major consequences. Sometimes that can be a privilege thing where I have the privilege to fail and people aren't going to go, man, Hanselman's a bozo. He keeps messing up. And for other people, uh, that's going to be uh, how many opportunities you can get because you can't collect stories like this unless you have opportunities. Now, this one here that was added, see where it says it's never twins? There are also going to be things that you need to remember that it's probably not going to be. It's never going to be. Um, there is a famous Sherlock Holmes where... Uh, someone uh, kills their husband and then the police say, oh my goodness, uh, they, 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 she killed her husband, but she has an alibi. She was on the other side of the, the, uh, the street. She was over in the other side of town. You know, she killed him on the west side, but we, she was seen on the east side. And then Watson says immediately, oh my goodness, Holmes, could it have been twins? And he says, no, it's never twins. It's never twins. There are things in technology that it just won't be. Um, and you'll learn those as well. One of the questions in the chat about how do we collect and remember these learnings? If you think that being in tech is about being an encyclopedia of little details, sometimes it can be. But I can only say this as an older person, you will be shocked at how many stories that you can remember. Uh, when you get old. And I hope that you all have the opportunity to get old. So the way that you collect these things is you either write them down or you make stories about them and remember those stories. Remembering individual little tech things is hard, but remembering stories is easier. I tend to write things down in Moleskin notebooks. So I would encourage you to start writing. I've got dozens and dozens and dozens of these. But uh, for, for, for me, I tell stories. Now, layering is an interesting thing in software, um, and layering hides complexity from yourself and from others. But layering, they don't tell you this in school, my friends, is actually just lying. The computer is lying from itself, lying to itself. It's hiding complexity behind uh, either a user interface or an API, an application uh, programming interface. So here's a good example where something is uh, being reused and we're kind of lying to ourselves, but um, no one really thinks about it. Here's an email. You've sent an email, but you don't really think about an email, right? You don't really think about how it's being sent. But I could take this email, and I'm going to turn it around, like I'm turning a picture around, and we're going to look at the back side of it. This is the back side of an email. This is what an email looks like if it didn't have a pretty user interface. Look at this. From colon, to colon, date colon, subject colon. It's just a series of name value pairs. Email is a hash table. You may have learned about hash tables in school. There's also a boundary here that separates the plain text 
from the other things that might be in the email. Now you may have worked on HTML before and you may have posted an HTML form. Here's what an HTML form looks like. Okay, so here is an email, name value pairs in text, and here's an HTML form. It's name value pairs in text. Email and HTML forms and most everything on the entire internet, whether it be Redis or Cosmos DB, is name value pairs at scale, which means once you learn an idea, you can learn that other ideas grow out of them. So effectively, it's all just internet traffic, isn't it? It's just text over ports. HTML is text that goes over a specific port and email is text that goes over another port. This is important to remember because just when you think that something is complicated, in fact, it's simple. Here's an example of a old record player, an RCA Victrola on the right-hand side here. And on the left-hand side is a hard drive. So isn't that interesting? Two spinning disks with information encoded on them with heads that retrieve and decode that information. It's almost like the wheel was a good idea and circles are efficient and interesting ways to share information. Now, when we understand these things, we can start composing them together. We can compose things where something has something else. We can build up systems and layer them together. This gentleman here is an actor named Chris Connor, and he was in a great show that you should check out called Altered Carbon. And in Altered Carbon, he played an AI. He played an artificial intelligence in the form of Edgar Allan Poe. These are the ravens from Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. And so in this show... The hero is, needs a place to stay, so he runs into this hotel. And Edgar Allan Poe here, Chris Connor, is the uh, is the AI that runs the hotel. So his his partner, his buddy, is Edgar Allan Poe. So I chatted him on Twitter because I was a fan of him as an actor because he does an amazing job. He just chews up the screen on uh, on Altered Carbon, and uh, I ended up doing a podcast with him. So here's me and Chris doing a podcast. And then I lost the files. I did the podcast. I'm thinking to myself, I've got a bromance now with this gentleman and we're gonna be friends. I'm gonna take my SD card home. And then here's what happened. I get home and I put the SD card into my computer and I see this. I see empty folders, not just empty folders, but an infinite number of empty folders just sitting there. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. I'm never gonna be able to hang out with this man again. The bromance is over. I've just wasted an hour of his time, had him drive to downtown Portland, do a podcast, it's a whole thing now. But then I look in Windows and I can see that the hard drive, the little SD card, thinks that it's got used space, but it clearly doesn't think that from a Windows Explorer's perspective. I'm not an expert in hardware. I'm not an expert in low level stuff. But remember, I learned how to learn. This is a problem, there's a system. How does this fit into the system? This thing has those bytes. Did the bytes disappear? Maybe they're just not accessible. It's like having a house and then walling off a door. The room still exists, but I need to find a new door. So I started learning about FAT, the file allocation table, F-A-T, FAT, and found a number of places where things were supposed to be other things. I started exploring the array of bytes that is the disk and ended up after many hours digging up those wave files and finding them. And I published the podcast and it was really good and I survived. Does that mean I'm an expert debugger? No. Does it mean that I recognize that nothing in the computer is hidden from me? That's the trick. I discovered that the system is composed of these layers and they build on top of each other. And while I had previously thought about things at this level, at the application level, I could go and read about file systems and IO and go deeper and deeper. You don't have to. If you wanna just take an Uber, that's great. But you could also learn how to be a mechanic, change your oil, learn about your tires and car maintenance, and you'll be a more interesting Uber rider.
And in doing this, we collect these patterns. Now that I've done that, now that I've had that story happen to me, I will be able to see it again and do something about it again. I've seen that before. One example of another, most of my stories, by the way, and most of your stories in software are going to be many, many, many hours of debugging because that's just how it is. Uh, you're going to find yourself doing something. I spent 13 hours debugging a, a thing on a Raspberry Pi. And it turns out when I took the two files, the good file and the bad file, and I compared them to each other, I made a folder here called good and another folder called weirdness. And I had another folder called bad. So I had this file was working on the Raspberry Pi and this file was not working. And look at this. I noticed that one byte, a single byte was being removed when I copied it to the Raspberry Pi. The zero D, you can see the hole here. The byte zero D was being removed when I copied my file over. Why would that happen? How weird is that? Well, it turns out I was using FTP, the file transfer protocol. And there was a feature here that says treat files without an extension as text, as ASCII. So I was sending a binary file over to another computer and it ended up being treated as a text file. So then what's zero D? Well, it's 2021, my friends. We are one fifth of the way through the 21st century and zero D still means carriage return. And the young people say, what's a carriage? Where is it returning? Well, my friends, a carriage is the top part of the typewriter that holds the paper. And the carriage return is this bar here, the carriage return lever. And you pull it back and you type, 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 type. And the carriage goes bump, 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 bump as it moves the paper. And then it goes ding and you carriage return. And then you line feed and you rotate this, what's called the platen and the paper comes up. Why are we talking about this in 2021? Because every text file and Git and GitHub and all the things that you do have carriage returns and line feeds, and you're gonna have to think about them at some point. So when I saw that zero D, I said to myself, that's 13 hex, which is a carriage return. And that's causing me trouble on a Raspberry Pi that was invented a hundred years after this typewriter was invented. But now I can go and learn about the history, I can read about these kinds of things. And a quite great, great question here in the chat that uh, someone is saying it can be draining to find the motivation for these things. How do I keep up? Um, you have to figure out where you find your energy. Is your energy found by going out? Is your energy found by going in? Is your energy found by sleeping? Is your energy found by partying? Everyone has their energy differently. My energy is discovering these stories. This is exciting stuff. How fun, how cool is this? Collecting these stories is where I find my joy. So um, we're going to run out of time here. So I'm going to just jump ahead a little bit and get towards the end here. And maybe we can actually ask a couple of questions as we get ready for our next guest. But I do know that uh, we are so glad that you're here, that you're joining us on this day. And uh, thank you. And I hope you follow me on Twitter. And I'm also on TikTok, which was probably a huge mistake, but I'm there anyway. So let's go back to our friends in the, uh, in the studio.